now. Maom Vishnu Padaya. Krish, I can record. Okay. Oh, you already did? No. No, I'm I'm going live on Facebook right now. Okay. We are live now in Facebook. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale. Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste. Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine. Nirvise Sasanyavadi Paschatya Satarine. So we'll look at Christie's question and we'll see. Um, I think we did cover it. I find this so difficult. I think this means living up to a high ideal. Because feeling like I should be a good example of representing my spiritual master and Prabhupada puts this extra pressure on top while I am already feeling like a failure due to my anarthas. Well, I think feeling like a failure, I think it's probably become clear from the classes that we've been doing that feeling like a failure is, 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 you know, it's a personal thing that you have to deal with yourself. I don't, I don't think if you feel like a failure, or at least for many of us, I don't think we actually need much to be a catalyst to feel like a failure, isn't it? Right? So if you already have that nature, then you come to ISKCON. Well, there's a lot of catalysts in ISKCON. So maybe it's just making you more aware that you have that nature. So I think that's where you want to look, you know, because you're saying, well, you know, I read Bhagavatam and I see these examples and it makes me feel like a failure. You know, for their average devotee, reading Bhagavatam is not going to make them feel like a failure. Or reading a letter from Prabhupada is not going to make them feel like a failure. There's got to be something already in, isn't it? Like, there's got to be some ingredients there, you know, like, that you're already working with. So I think that's important to recognize. And we, we talked about that, different ways of interpreting the philosophy. But of course, what's coming up now is how the interpretation is being made depends, depends on our previous samskaras conditioning. So I think that's the best way to look at it. It's not, it's not really an issue a religious issue so much, but I'm allowing the religious issues to become the issue. That's what's happening. Right? So be aware of that. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like you need, you know, a little warning sign when you take to spiritual life, like warning, if you have a tendency for guilt, it's probably going to get stimulated when you read our books, because if you if you if you tend to feel guilty, there's going to be a lot of things in these books that are going to make you feel guilty, or potentially could, if you have that nature. If you don't have that nature, they won't. They'll inspire you to be better, right? So the same statement inspires one person, and, and makes another person feel like a failure. So that's self-reflection you have to do yourself, right? And Christy's not here to get the answer to the question. <laughs> anyway, she can hear, she can hear the answer later. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's just a reality that if you have a tendency to feel guilty, there, there potentially are many things that can make you feel guilty because you're really being asked to come to a very high level. I mean, Krishna consciousness is beyond morality, you know. We're asking you to become way more than moral. We're actually asking you to become human, which probably no one has ever asked you to do that before. But, you know, human, human society today doesn't have a high standard, doesn't, it's not really human, at least not according to the Vedas. 
And that's why Prabhupada would often call human society animalistic. I mean, if people were human, we wouldn't be having the problems we have today. I mean, do humans, you know, destroy the planet? No, they don't. Do humans engage in warfare over oil or political ideals? No, they don't. Do humans create demarcation and don't allow you into their country because you have the wrong passport? No, they don't do that. So really, you know, we've never been, we've never been trained to be human. And so that's part of it. It's a high, you know, that's a high position. What to speak of being Krishna conscious? That's beyond being human. Now you have to be, it's hard enough to be human. Now you have to go beyond being human. So, you know, you have a tendency to feel guilty. Well, you've got plenty to feel guilty about right now. The, the other way to take it is, and the proper way to take it is that this is beautiful. It's a beautiful philosophy. It's a beautiful ideal. It's something that resonates with me, resonates with my heart. This is, I want to become this. And then you become excited about it. It becomes, you know, fills you with happiness and excitement that this is, you're on the path to achieving this. And like a little kid who's learning to walk, he falls down, he doesn't complain, he just gets up again. So it's like, that's, that's the proper way to take it. So if you have a tendency towards guilt, then you want to learn how to take it properly. You know, with excitement, enthusiasm, this is beautiful. I, I, I don't know if you had this experience but you know, in the Gita, Krishna describes the qualities of a devotee. And when I would read those qualities, I would feel so good. I, and I would and I would think, well, I want to, I want to be like this. I'm not like this, but I want to be like this. And then I when I would hear the stories, especially where, where a devotee exhibits great, great humility or great forgiveness, great apology, or, or some something that is some beautiful quality that we wish we had and we wish everyone in the world had. When I read that, I just think, well, it's amazing that people, that someone walked this planet who has this quality. You know, it's so inspiring. So that's the way we want to take it. Now, I don't have that quality, so should I not be inspired by it? That's the reason I should be inspired by it, because I don't have it. At least one of the reasons. I can be inspired if I have it. But should I be discouraged because I don't have it? That, that's a, that's a filter, and so we want to remove that filter. And you know, we have all kinds of filters that were placed, either placed in our minds by others, or we place them in our minds to make sense of life or to protect ourselves. But you know, you may have that filter for you know because it helped you when you were seven years old. But obviously, it doesn't help you now, so you can take the filter out. And so a lot of us have filters from days past, and those filters made sense then, but now they don't make sense, and we still have the same filter. You know, it's like, it's like you ever see someone wearing sunglasses inside, and you're thinking, why are you wearing sunglasses? There's no sun here, right? Usually they do it because they're they think they look better with sunglasses or, and they're getting old and they don't want anybody to see all the wrinkles around their eyes or something, or it's their image or whatever, or, but it's a little bit like that. I'm like, okay, I know it was sunny outside, but now you're inside. Why are you wearing your sunglasses? So I know that, you know, when this happened, you were made to feel guilty, it really wasn't your fault, but you were made to believe it was, but that was then. No need to carry that filter now. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so we all do it, you know, consciously or unconsciously. We all do it. And so you it's not like all the filters you have are bad, but pro the process of growth is to keep the good filters and remove the filters that are getting in the way of whatever it is you're trying to achieve materially or spiritually. And they're, for us as devotees, they're kind of intertwined. So awareness of those filters. When 
when something is a catalyst for a certain reaction, and there are multiple reactions that you could have from that same catalyst, and your reaction is not good for you, then you should, you know, take note of that. Say, okay, here's a problem that this happens and I become depressed or I become angry or feel guilty or whatever. And this, uh, if it's not helping you, then, okay, I have a filter. And this situation activated that filter. And, you know, let's imagine different filters coming in front of a lens. And there's so many. And now this one is coming in front of the lens. You know, we were, we were, um, we have this conflict resolution class today, every Wednesday. And so we were talking about how uh, sometimes what happens is when you join ISKCON, ISKCON is a certain way or a temple is a certain way. And then 10 or 20 years from now, or, or even just going to another country, it's different. And so you'll think the way that it is in a new country or the way it is in 10 years, you'll tend to think it's wrong because you're used to a different way, because that's the filter you grew up with, you know. Well, my temple president told me A, B, and C. Now I go to somewhere, some other temple, they don't do that. So I have this filter that A, B, and C is right. Actually, what they're doing in the other temple may actually be right, and maybe what you were taught to do, or maybe the way your temple ran things was not the best way, and this is a better way. But you'll tend to think the way you were trained is the best way. That's just, you know, human nature. So we just have to become aware of these things, right? Yes, like being aware of prejudices and being judgmental. Interpreting things. We did a, an exercise. There was a, um, a picture of a guy wearing a Nike, I think, headband and maybe a, a Nike armband. And he was in a posture where it looked like he I either could have been angry or excited. It's hard to tell. So Braj Bihari showed us the picture and said, what do you see? And everybody said different things. I see a person who's excited or angry or someone who feels like he could do anything. And, and it was maybe like 10 other ideas. And then after the exercise, he said, I didn't ask for you to interpret it. In, excuse me, interpret, it's not a word. Interpret, I didn't ask you to interpret his emotion, I just asked you, what did you see? And only one devotee said, I see a young man with a, a blue shirt and a Nike armband and a Nike headband. So he was just doing that exercise as a, an example of how we um, are judgmental. You're just asked to see, but then you ended up judging the person's state of mind. Isn't that funny? It's so interesting, you know. And and um, so, you know, we all do that, obviously. And we're not aware that we do that until someone makes us aware. So um, we're talking about conflict resolution. And a lot of times in conflict resolution, like, you know, you'll be arguing over how something should go because that's the way it went when you joined ISKCON. And you don't even realize that that's why you believe that. It's just, you know, this is the right way. Why is it the right way? Because my temple president did it. Could he have been wrong? Could he have been lacking information? Of course. <clears throat> but generally, we don't think that way. So it's good to be aware of these things, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And... And I was I was having just a, a little bit of a, a realization that you know if we were more like that we would have less conflict flick because we would understand where the conflict's coming from. Uh, he gave another example, which is this is really interesting. They had a Goshala in Vrindavan, and I think there was a problem, some problem funding it, or they had to minimize minimize it. <clears throat> At least he thought. Raja Bihari thought they had to, I don't know, get rid of it, minimize it, something like that. And there's another devotee who was raised on a farm and Raja Bihari was raised in New York. And he had a different view because he was raised around cows. He said, no, you can't do this. This cow, cow protecting cows and breeding cows is, is essentially important. So he was making the point, it's like two different people 
raised in two different environments have two different positions on cows. So, you know, what is your position on anything? Well, that will be highly influenced by everything that happened to you in life. Every movie you saw, every book you read, isn't it? Every friend you had, every newspaper article you read, every Facebook post, all these things. So in case you don't know, of course you know this, in case you, everything you read isn't true. Yeah. Of course we know that, but then we read it and we go, ah, oh, this is a big problem. And we go on, you know, ready to, you know, create an organization to fight this problem. And later you find it was just fake news. So some, you know, 13 year old kid, you know, was having fun, you know, on Facebook, trying to get people to believe in something that he just made up. So self-awareness will, will help in so many ways. Okay. I'll go to chat. Unfortunately, my okay, here we go. We'll go to the next question, which I believe is from the last class. And then my tray says, apologies are crucial and offering obeisances is good too. Hugging is also good. Well, as long as it's not the opposite sex until you're until you're on the level of prema, which you won't be in this life, so you don't have to worry. Um, yeah, apologies, apologies um, are extremely important individually and for the organization. But there's one thing you have to understand about apologies. Sometimes you may apologize to get yourself off the hook, and sometimes. You may apologize to pacify, but there's no remorse or rectification going on. There's no rectification that's going to go on. You're just like, I should have. My wife told me to apologize. I walk in with the tail between my legs. I'm sorry I did that. Now my wife's happy and she's going to cook dinner for me. You know, So it's totally insincere apology, right? Um, and if apologies are insincere, um, they're often worse because it communicates that you didn't really recognize what you did, right? So a better apology is to, to state that you recognize how this hurt the person uh, in addition to the fact that, you know, I shouldn't have done this or it was a mistake or however you want to express uh, this was the wrong thing I did. And, but recognize um, how it they must have felt, how it inconvenienced them. This have must really created a problem for you. You must have felt really disappointed in me. Then they understand that you understand. But you just go, I'm sorry I did that. And you're off. I'm like, did he just do that? So he, you know, is that just an excuse? Is he going to do it again? Yeah. Right? You understand that. So the wrong apology could be more problematic than no apology. Kopi Jivana says, the spiritual world is a community and we have to learn how to be part of it. If you don't like people, don't go back to Godhead because there's a lot of them up there. Um, and they all want to associate with you. So you know, if you want to live in a cave, I don't think there are any caves up there. I mean, maybe. But I don't, I haven't heard about anybody. You know, there's no like sadhus meditating up there. They're all serving Krishna together. So, you know. Better learn how to get along now, because when you go there, you're going to see all the people down here that you didn't like. Hmm. What are you going to do then? Oh, no, I didn't know you were up here. If I knew you were up here, I never would have even tried. To, you know, I would have stopped chanting my rounds long ago. I don't, I don't want to see you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Krishna. Uh oh you know, life is funny, isn't it? Um, and I always say, you know, sometimes joking about it is the best way to, to, to you know, acknowledge our own mistakes. Because if you laugh, it's easier to get it in because the false ego tends to like kind of disappear while you're laughing. And then it, then it comes back and just covers you up when you stop laughing, isn't it? 
because it's the false ego that's it's really hard to get things through. And that's why sometimes you'll sometimes hear an instruction and may feel upset about it or offended, where if we can laugh about it, it probably would, would be easier to get in there. Sru John says, when some devotees are doing deity worship or doing Abhishek on the altar during festivals, get the feeling of having brought, um, do you get the feeling that you want to have Brahman initiation? Uh, we were talking about initiation, yeah. That's okay, as long as you're qualified. You know, it's not that no one should aspire for initiation. That was, wasn't what I meant. It, it's just, you know, don't try to lift 200 pounds, you know, tomorrow. That's about 90, 200 pounds is about 90 kilos. Don't try to lift 90 kilos. You know, try to lift 30 and work your way up. And if you're ready to lift 90 kilos, okay, lift it. That's the point. So, you know, to be inspired to come to a higher stages is, is, is good and we should be inspired. But to be inspired to come to a higher stage that you're not ready to come to now, you may have to have a timeline a timeline on your inspiration. Sometimes a timeline on our inspiration is too short and then it backfires and we, you know, if you're high jumping, so I, well, when I was in high school, I would high jump. They have a bar and you run and jump over it. And I think I would high jump about five and a half feet if I remember, like when I was 16 or something. And I, I put a string in my backyard and I used to jump over. So I was pretty good because I could practice at home, right? So I felt good. I could, you know, do it. I was like on the C team or the junior team. So I was good for a junior. If you put me on the, like, the team of people older than me and the bar is higher, I feel like a failure. I can't jump over it, right? So it's the same way, you know, I can aspire to high jump seven feet, but I have to put it on my timeline. It's like, oh, that, you know, I'm a, I'm a junior or a sophomore. When I become a senior, I'll be able to do it. That's okay. But if you, you try to do it as a junior, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I'm not saying that you can't, you can't, but if you can't, or if you try and you realize you can't, you know, then put it on a timeline, you'll be okay. So when you get your timeline messed up, I think that's an important point, isn't it? You ever get your timeline messed up? You join this kind of go like three, three months, I'm gonna be self-realized. Do you feel like that? I did. That's one of the first illusions that's broken, you know. You join ISKCON, you go, oh my God, everyone in ISKCON is a pure devotee. In three months, I'll also be a pure devotee. You know, three months later, you get the next realization. Well, there are some pure devotees, but not all of them. And you know, it's probably going to take me more than three months. And then your next realization, are there any pure devotees in ISKCON? <laughs> and then when you get really bad, then you get to the level, am I the only pure devotee in ISKCON? And then that's probably your last day in ISKCON, you know, if that happens to you. Not everyone gets to that stage, am I the only pure devotee? But some do. So yeah, you know, you can be inspired by anything as long as it's, it's correctly placed on your timeline because that will prevent you from becoming discouraged. You know, someday I want to be a blank. When do you think you can do that? I think by the time I'm 65, I can do that. Okay. You know, I want to do it tomorrow. That could create problems for you, discourage you. So we have a question. We have a statement question from Pi. It says, regarding wanting perfection from ourselves, I read a question today. A devotee asked another guru, and I would so much like to know your answer to it. I think there might be more than one way to answer the question. The question was something like, maybe I already answered it, right? I want so much to go back to God that when I die, and I'm working on it. But what if I'm not 100% perfect and ready when the day comes? What happens to me? I think... Um, 
I don't think any of us are going to be 100% perfect when that day comes. And I don't think we have to be. Because, because I've, as I've said before, Prabhupada negotiated a deal for the less than perfect, all his less than perfect disciples, which is 100% of them, even the pure devotee disciples. Even Prabhupada said, I'm not perfect. So, you know, Prabhupada told us 16 rounds, four regulative principles, be sincere, serve, give your life. And he always said, if you do that, you give your life, you'll go back to Godhead. So he never said, if you give your life to the Sankirtan movement, chant 16 rounds without offense, follow four principles, and you're perfect, then you go back to Godhead. He left it, and you're perfect, out of it. And perhaps we could say, well, maybe in Prabhupada's mind, that was perfect. It's not perfect in our mind, but maybe it should be. You know, as I've often said, that there's a lot of things we don't have control of. And one of them is how perfect we are and how pure we are, right? That we have control of the process, how we execute the process that will get us there, but we don't have control of the result, right? I mean, some things in this world, you have control both of the process and the result, because if you're playing an instrument, if you control the process properly, you'll get the result. But in relationships, you don't, right? You know, Relationships are different. They're not, they don't work on the same, the same way. So someone who doesn't look like they should go back to Godhead can, someone who looks like they should may not. There may be other things involved. So Prabhupada talked about sincerity more than perfection. So we should all bet on sincerity. Because if you bet on perfection, you're going to lose the bet, at least until you get back to Godhead. And then even back to Godhead, you can be more perfect, eternally more perfect. If you bet on sincerity, if you bet on dedication, if you bet on adherence to the instructions of Prabhupada, yeah. I, I often, I was, just, I was just reading a website of a Gaudiya Math organization and it lists all their leaders. Some of the leaders in that are my friends. They used to be in ISKCON and now they went to this other organization. But not all of them were. And one, one said something like, he was born in Vrindavan, you know, he like read Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, 12 times by the age of two. You know, I'm exaggerating, but it was, you know, when I read it, it was like, okay. You know, this is like, I'm not in that league. And, you know, so I can't compete with, you know, he like, he knows Sanskrit, he knows Hindi, he knows Bengali. He's done, you know, 3000 Bhagavad Saptahas by the age of 12. And, you know, so I'm going down his list of qualifications. <clears throat> Those are not the qualifications that a person born in Los Angeles would have, born in 1950. He just wouldn't have that because, you know, they didn't even let Indians in America until like 65 or something. I mean, you could, yeah, like so. And so, uh, and so, you know, that could make me think, you know, I should probably just give up because I don't have these qualifications, right? And so how do I deal with that? I think, I always think, what does Prabhupada want me to do? What is in his heart? What is his instruction? How can I adhere to that instruction? That will be my success. Bless it. That will be my success. Because I don't have the other qualifications. It's too late to have those. I was already born. I'm already, you know, joined this when I was 20. So I blew, I blew 19. I blew the first 19 years. So I can't make up for it in that sense. <clears throat> I can make up for it in the sense of trying to enter into deeply into what Prabhupada wanted, and, and so much success will come from that. I just was listening to a lecture this morning, and Prabhupada said, if you, if you, how did he say it? More or less, he said, like, if you follow these instructions, if you're pure, he said, you cannot imagine what you can achieve. It's like incredible success. And Prabhupada always said that about himself. I'm not 
particularly qualified. So that's how I see it. What did the other guru say? Did you hear the answer? He said, nah, forget it. You know, you'll never, if you have a, if you have a drop of desire to eat one sweet, you're like, forget it. You're not going back to content. Pai is going to give us, it's going to type in the answer. Let's see if we think alike. Okay, she's, I'm going to go down. I mean, there's that lecture Prabhupada said, if you're attached to a sweet ball, you can't go back to Godhead. But there's a but here, and this is a hermeneutical analysis. Sometimes Prabhupada said something, but he only said it once. And he said other things many times. So like, and then we get worried about the thing he said once. And so generally in hermeneutics, if it was only said once and something else was said many more times, you would put more emphasis on the other. And so Prabhupada did say, you know, attached to one sweet bowl, you're in trouble. But he only said it once. Okay, we'll get the answer. Oh, wait a minute. I'm getting messed up here. He said, surely, why don't you become 100% right now? <laughs> that way you don't have to be concerned. That's a short version of yeah. Right, good luck on the 100%. Yeah. But, but if, if that's the answer, then we're going to have to define what 100% perfect means. And I think we could say, my answer is 100% perfect. That would be you know, how we could amalgamate the two. Of course, that devotee who heard the answer might have just blooped after he heard that question. He goes, I gotta be 100%. I can't go back to Godhead. So, you know, let's go, you know, go to the pub tonight. I hope that didn't happen. But it could happen, right? If I had a lot of time on my hand and a few videographers, I would make little scenarios like that, you know, put them out there for devotees. Devotee sitting in the class, here's that answer. He goes, okay, I give up. You know, two devotees, you know, they hear the same answer and in two different scenarios and you just follow them, you know. And one devotee's like chanting, like, you know, he, he runs out and chants 25 rounds and goes on book distribution for 10 hours. Like, what happened? Well, he said, I have to become 100%, so I'm, I'm doing it. And the other one totally gives up. Right? How to understand a concept by Prabhupada that work hard in devotional service, 40% following all four regular principles, and he will take us back to God. I don't know about the 40%. Heard it from a local devotee. Is it true? Um, Prabhupada said different things. You dedicate your life to preaching. You go back to Godhead, dedicate your life to book distribution, you go back to Godhead. But, you know, if we analyze everything he's, he said, you know, we see that there, when he said one thing, there are other elements. How could you dedicate your life to preaching if you weren't chanting good rounds and following the four principles? So then, you know, then he said, and then um, he often said, chant 16 rounds and follow the four principles, right? Okay, well, what kind of rounds? Shnik, shnik, mom, mom, hari, hari. Shnik, shnik, nom, nom, hari, hari. Not like that, you know, offensive rounds and you go back to Godhead. There's nothing in Shastra that states that you can go back to Godhead by nom aparad. So we understand Prabhupada saying, you're chanting without offense. And if you chant without offense, your consciousness will be clean. Um, so that's part of it, that you will become pure by doing that. You will become pure by dedicating your life. And the other part of it is that because you do that, I'll, you know, if there's any slack, I'll make up for it. You know, that's, that's the way I have always understood it. At least if I look at myself and I think, am I 100% perfect? What if I die today? You know, what does that mean? Maybe I'll die today while I'm thinking of devotional service. That's all I was thinking of, you know. 
Is that 100% perfect? What did Prabhupada mean? Prabhupada was very lenient, as I've said, and Prabhupada knew that he was dealing with people who were not born in Brahmin families or raised as Vaishnavas. So, in the mood of Mahaprabhu's mercy, there's, you know, if it was kind of like, you, you follow me and you'll be okay. Just follow me, just do what I say. But Prabhupada, I make offense. Just try not to make offense. But Prabhupada, sometimes I think about this. So I'll just try to control it. But Prabhupada, sometimes I'm envy, all right? Well, just don't act it out. You know, it's like that. Just subdue all these vagums, these pushings, so that you can serve me and you can follow these principles and I'll take care of everything else. So, you know, all the struggle we go through and all the disappointments and like, it's just, why don't I just give up? No, you should take it the opposite way and say that, that if I can go on with my devotional service in spite of all the obstacles, then I get the mercy. Then Prabhupada says, I will take you, right? But if the obstacles become the cause of derailing me or discouraging me, then I misunderstood it. It's, it's, not, it's not that the obstacles are signs that you're not a good devotee. They're signs that you're a conditioned soul. The obst if you give in to the obstacle, that's a sign of weakness. Having the obstacle is not always a sign of weakness. You can say it is in a certain sense because you may be in the mode of passion or ignorance and you've allowed yourself to be in that mode and that mode contains a lot of, that, of those desires. But still, there's deep-rooted conditioning. And so if you're, if you're living a sattvic life and there's still this conditioning comes up, then rather than become discouraged about it, you should think, I just need to manage this. I need to be able to deal with this. That's really you know, more important to put your energy on management than it is on being depressed, right? Isn't it? Manage, manage it. You know, I'm a diabetic. I got to manage my blood sugar levels, right? I'm a this or that. I, I've got high cholesterol. I've got to manage what I eat so I, I can reduce my cholesterol or whatever it is, right? I have high blood pressure. I got to exercise more or whatever you have to do. I have to manage it. Take this medicine, get more exercise, do pranayam, whatever. Does that make sense? Srujan, don't give up. That's all I can say. But I'm so volatile. What's the use of going on? If you knew what I was thinking, you'd probably commit suicide. You know? No, manage it. That's your success is in managing it. Your success is in showing Krishna that I will go on in spite of this. That's that's it's almost like the anartha becomes an impetus for bhakti, because Krishna sees that you're willing to go forward despite all these anarthas that are weighing you down. You're not going to let them weigh you down. You can, you know, you have a big backpack to carry, but you're still going up the mountain. You're not going to let the heavy backpack stop you. So the anarthas, in a sense, are just, you know, they're just actually helping. Because, you know, okay, I just have to work harder to get up the mountain. Okay, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. So, Tanya says, when Jayananda Prabhu left his body, Prabhupada addressed a letter to him saying, I so hope at the time of your death, you were remembering Krishna, and as such, you have been promoted to the eternal association of Krishna. If not, if you had any tinge of material desire, you have gone to the celestial kingdom. Okay, what does Prabhupada mean? Tinge of material desire. Kingdom with the demigods for many thousands of years and enjoy the most opulent life, material existence. The good news comes at the end of the letter. From there, you can promote yourself to the spiritual world. But even if one fails to promote himself to the spiritual world at the time he comes down again on the surface of the globe, takes birth in a big family like yogis or brahmins or an aristocratic family where there's again a chance of reviving Krishna consciousness. Here's the good news, everyone. But as you were hearing Krishna Kirtan, I'm sure that you were directly promoted to Krishna Loka. 
I understand we won't be perfect, but is it that we have to be free of every material desire? What, what, when Prabhupada, I know the scary word tinge, you have, you know, if you have a tinge of material desire, what did Prabhupada mean by tinge of material desire? So, Tanya, you're on your deathbed and you're like, you know, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to go to America and live in America, start my own company. And I just can't get this desire out of me. And now I'm only 53. Well, you're not 53 now, but let's say when you're 53, you know, you find out that you have cancer and, you know, hopefully this won't happen. But just as an example, and you're like, <clears throat> I always wanted to do blank and I can't get this desire out of me. I always wanted to do a TED talk. Or I always wanted to write this book and I never finished this book. And it's like, and then you take your next birth and like, you know, eight years old, you're like the smartest girl that ever hit the planet. And you finish writing your book when you're like 12. I'm like, how did she do that? And now we know it was the last life. So that's what Prabhupada's talking about. Like this irretractable desire you just can't get rid of it and you know even though you're dying it's just like i that's what he means he doesn't mean like you know well you know i really did like my husband you know it would have been nice to have another one yeah you know some fleeting thought that went through your mind every you know once every 20 years it's not like that okay. even if it went through your thought your mind every day if you were never going to do it and it's not serious you wouldn't be thinking of that at the time of death. You know? Damn, I wish I should have left him. You know, I got to get a better husband. Now it's too late. I'm dying. Yeah, then you'll come back. But if it was just like, oh, this marriage never went good. I used to think about leaving him, but whatever. Krishna's mercy. You know, now I'm detached. That's different. So Prabhupada means like, you know, you're very focused on this. You know, I want to become a famous this and that. I didn't achieve it. And so I come back or, you know. I'm really attached to enjoying, and I still have these strong desires to enjoy. Okay, get a body. But if that, if you're like Krishna, I just want to serve you and whatever you want, that's where you're at, then you're not going to stay here. And many, many devotees, that's where they're at right now. They have no, they really have nothing. There's really nothing keeping them here other than their service. That's the only reason they're eating and sleeping and maintaining their bodies for service. So that's the idea. Otherwise, you know, it's like a tinge of material desire, yeah. We had a god sister, and she was dying, and they said, do you have any attachment? And she was from Los Angeles, and there was a restaurant there, and they had this, she loved salads, and it had a certain salad dressing. She said, my only attachment is to that salad at the temple with that salad dressing. Yeah. Probably not going to keep her in the material world, you know. Oh no, she came back as a, let, a head of lettuce. No, it's not going to happen. You know, it's like Krishna's, it's not like that. You know? Krishna is the most loving. Well, on the, on the material desire meter, it registered at 0 0.00000000001. So you're going to have to come back. I'm sorry to tell you, to be the bearer of bad news. Krishna's not like that, right? And so you don't want to see Krishna that way. That would be a bad way to see him because it's not his nature. I understand those of you who are raised as Christians may, or in other religions, maybe they see it that way or some sects of that religion might see it that way. It's very black and white. Do this, go to heaven, don't do that, you won't. But Krishna's a person. And that's why, you know, I have a disciple. He, he has asked me I have six or eight questions about how you get back to Godhead. You know, does, will this person go back to Godhead if they do this, if they hear this, if the, on, this, on this auspicious time, if they do this, will they go back to Godhead? And, you know, the ultimate answer is that's up to Krishna because Prabhupada has said enough things that all kinds of people, he said, went back to Godhead that, that I didn't think by, you know, shot my Shastric understanding could have made it there. You know, like, you know, what did they do? How'd they get in? You know, wasn't there any, didn't anybody stop them? You know, was Prabhupada there? It's like, let him in. 
you know, or the, the, what kind of arrangements. Because Prabhupada said one of his disciples went back to Godhead. It was a very young devotee, died in a car accident. And he said he shouldn't have, but he did. So like, what does that mean? He shouldn't have, but he did. You know, not like we can count on it. And then there's a higher, there's a, Shujan, there's a higher, or maybe a better answer to this question, which is don't worry about it. Just try to be a pure devotee. And let Krishna do with you whatever he does. You know, that's the, the real answer. You know, why don't you worry about the fact that there's 8 billion, 200 million people that don't know about Krishna? Or maybe 8 billion, 100 million that don't know about Krishna, at least properly about Krishna, that need help. And how can I save them rather, rather than, you know, if I'm attached to a salad, will I go back to God? That's, that's not where you want to put your thought process. At least I wouldn't recommend it. Hmm. Pai says, sometimes the obstacles are bringing us closer to Krishna. When we struggle, we need him more than ever, which gives us a choice. Do I want to listen to Maya or do I want to be humble and ask for Krishna's help? Yeah. And I... It's so true. And I, you know, one of the most unfortunate things is when the obstacle pushes you away from Krishna because the obstacle could have brought you closer. My question is does it mean that he sometimes allows the obstacles to be there? Exactly. He actually sometimes places, personally places them in front of you. There's a philosophical explanation. When you become a devotee, all your karma is removed, but Krishna may keep some of it because that karma could help you. Let's say, you know, you have some very strong attachment that's really hard to break. And you have some karma that causes you to suffer when you pursue that attachment. And so Krishna thinks, you know, I'm going to keep that karma there. And every time you put your hand in the cookie jar, there's a snake is going to bite it. And, you know, after you get bit a few times, you'll think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't eat these cookies, you know. And then you realize, thank you, Krishna, for, for putting the snake there, because I would eat a jar of cookies every day. The snake wasn't there to bite me. And you'll understand that because you know where your attachments are. And when these these events, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but there's like some situation you're trying to do something and, and then you like trip and sprain your ankle and then you're, you go to the hospital and you couldn't do it and, you, and you're sitting in the hospital and it's like, oh my God, Krishna, that was heavy. Because you knew if I did that, I would have fallen on my face. So, you know, I can't fall on my face now because I can't get far enough to fall because I just sprained my ankle. Right, I think uh, some one of you or someone had written me that, they had COVID or something. And it was like, it was really good because time for reflection, more time to read, chant. You know, um, you know we, we try to enjoy something and Krishna creates suffering. The message is, you know, probably this is a, a, I have a strong attachment for this. And Krishna is telling me, I will never let you enjoy this. And the only way you're ever going to enjoy this is when you stop trying to enjoy it. Then I'll let you enjoy it. I always tell the men, I say, I tell the men because this is this is our philosophy and also my personal experience. You cannot enjoy a woman by any other process other than serving and respecting her. It's impossible. That's the only way you'll enjoy. It. It's a different different kind of enjoyment. Um, but in my own relationship with my wife, the more I serve, the more I respect, the better our relationship gets. And if I try to dominate and enjoy, the worse it gets. So every time I try to dominate and enjoy, it gets bad. And Krishna said, saying, I told you, I'm never going to let you enjoy this unless you serve. And obviously, serve is not trying to enjoy. It's trying to make the other person happy. And, that, and then the relationship becomes better, and then I become happy. So it only took me like, you know, 20 years to figure that one out. 
so you had to suffer for 20 years because you know there's thick plates around the brain right and it like takes 20 years to get through each layer you ever have that experience like well you're all not as old as i am but some of you are a little older and the older you are the more you realize that took a long time to figure out you know like why didn't i figure it out when it first happened because i was so stubborn on enjoying this and and it was like obvious Krishna was doing it, but I didn't want to admit it because I wanted to enjoy it. And I had to, you know, sprain my ankle like every time I tried to do that or get slapped in the face every time I tried to do that. And finally, I realized I shouldn't try to do this. Krishna has, he's not going to let me do it. Thank you, Krishna, because you know I'm attached. You're not going to let me enjoy this. Thank you. And then you just give up trying to enjoy it. What a blessing, isn't it? Thank you, Krishna. So kind. So if Krishna sees you have some karma there that could help you detach from something, he'll just allow that karma. But it's not it's not karma anymore because he he removed your karma. But I thought, oh, but here's some good here's some karma which will be good for you. So we'll just keep it. Or he'll create some, you know, some situation. You know when it happens. Thank you, Krishna. Um, I think she has P.S. P is saying, I'm going to jump ahead because she's answering. Lyme disease in a wheelchair brought me to Krishna. It took me 28 years for my first lesson. Yeah, I mean, you know. But in the scope of eternity, 28 years is a flash. You know, so, you know, I mean, if we finally get the lesson, celebrate. And you know, then we don't have to worry how long it took. It's just, you know, we're we're dull, dull brain. You know, Kali Yuga. What can we do? Slow learners. Got to get hit a bit before you learn. Uh, force me to Sydney says. Uh, force me to be myself with Krishna, which is and was the biggest lesson, blessing and lesson. Okay. That's all the questions, right? Comments? More? Oh, Tanya has where? You want to say it or are you or are you agreeing with me or what? You're saying there's more? There's anything on Facebook? There's more down there? Um, Shujan. Okay. Yeah, there's more. Go down. How to maintain the mood and stability in devotional service day after day? You know. Read Bhagavad Gita because Bhagavad Gita is actually amazing. I I think I think we don't realize how amazing it is because practically every problem we have, Krishna answers in Bhagavad Gita by saying, "Don't be affected by duality." You know, I mean, there's so many verses in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is saying, "Don't be affected by duality," and then. And then, like the cream, the cake, the cream, the icing on the cake. You know, put you put cream on cake. I don't know, drips off. You have to cook the cream a bit. Whipped cream, yeah. Okay, the whipped cream on the cake, on whipped cream on the pie. Krishna says, and if and if you do that, you're dear to me. If you're not affected by it, um, we're just reading some verses this morning where Krishna is describing the mode of goodness. And he said, when you're in the mode of goodness, you're equal in happiness and distress and so forth. You're, you're, you're peaceful. When you deal with a situation, you don't react negatively. You don't get overwhelmed when things are going well. I mean, how valuable is that? And so your answer, Sri John, is you have to come to the mode of goodness. And in the mode of goodness, you become peaceful. You know, if any of you have anger issues and you live a passionate life, it's just it's just adding fuel to the fire. When you come to sattva, it dissolves the anger because there's no anger in sattva, at least not material anger. So many of the things we don't want, they don't exist in sattva. They exist in rajas and tamas. So that's the, that from a philosophical spec, uh, perspective, that's the answer. Be lives live a life of sattva. 
you know, like so the devotees say, well, how do I forgive? Get out of ignorance, because that's where uh, resentment is coming from. Get out of ignorance. How do I overcome my anger? Get out of ignorance. How do I control myself sexually? Get out of passion. And if you go on the altar when you're a Brahmin and go on the altar, or if you have deities at home and you bathe and you do everything like you're going on the altar, you're like, Om Shanti Shanti. The modes just drop off, isn't it? You're, re you're ready to love everyone in the world and forgive everyone. Then when you get off the altar, that's a different story, right? The day starts, the modes of passion start cranking and like, I hate that guy, you know, I want to kill him. But you weren't feeling that when you're on the altar or you're chanting good rounds. Uh, you know, it's like amazing, right? Krishna blessed me last night by I was so busy. I was, I, I hate to admit this, but I'm going to, in the name of vulnerability, just so you know, even the guru does this. I started chanting my rounds last night at at eight at 840. That's when I started my first round, believe it or not. I mean, the day was crazy. It's just like, okay, now I'm going to chant. I had a I had something going on in the morning. I had to finish something. I did it in the morning. It's been one of those. If i supposed to finish something and it goes on like for seven, 10 days and I go, it's never going to be finished. I'll just do it in the morning first thing because it's the only way I'll get done. But when you do that, your rounds, you know, so like, okay, I'm going to chant at 10 o'clock. Uh, no, well, that was at 11. So it went all day. You see this thing? This is Ravana's head. It just keeps... His heads keep popping up. I kill all the heads by answering. And then as soon as I kill 10 heads, 15 rise up. And then Ravana appears on um, Facebook Messenger and he appears on uh, my email. So, and I had just heard a lecture in which Bhano Swami was saying that sound is the subtle form. The mantra is the subtle form of the deity. It's, you know, like you can, um, I have to hear what he was saying more. It was, you know, it was kind of like a material analysis of sound. The frequencies of sound represent in the physical realm. And I was meditating on, you know, we know Krishna's present in sound. But when he said that, I was like, oh, yantras are physical forms. This is what this, you have a yantra. This is what the sound looks like. It's just a visual representation of the sound. And they have an experiment where they had they had different sounds in them and connected to a machine and the machine would engrave images in sand and all these mandalas and designs came out based on the sound when they played rock and rolls like monsters came out of it like you see monster faces kind of but when it was soft music you'd see these like mandalas and this is not the water experiment this is the sand experiment so i was i was thinking like that and i was and I was chanting, and something happened where it was like, I like clicked into this realm where I was like, Krishna is like right with me. It's like he's fully here. And it went all the way until I went to sleep, you know, which is, it's, it's so good to chant rounds before you go to sleep. They're so much better in the morning when you wake up. As soon as I woke up in the morning, it's like, I was like, I chanted myself to sleep, and as soon as I woke up, I just continued where I left off. It was like, you know, it was just like, had to eat lunch, and then I'm chanting again. It was like that. And so, but when I was chanting that way, and it was late at night, and Krishna somehow really kept me awake. It was amazing. I wasn't tired. And at that point, it was like, I was not, I was not part of this, this realm at all. I just wasn't. And, and when you listen to Prabhupada's lectures, he's always saying, if you're absorbed in Krishna consciousness, you don't have problems. These, you know, all this stuff is on the material level. So that's the that's the real solution, you know. Just absorb, absorb, absorb. Okay, so we're gonna end class. I will stop the recording and Anurad is gonna stop the Facebook, right? Or you want me to stop it? You're going to stop it, okay? And then we will 
again resume. I, I am so busy, I could actually 